you have acid indigestion, minutes hang like hours. So remember, thumbs start working right here. Now, where will you go for relief? Over 50 years ago, Clarence Gaines cared enough to realize that his dogs needed more than table scraps. That's why he invented the world's first complete dog food that guaranteed balanced nutrition and good taste. Today, Gaines, the company he started, puts over 50 years of experience. Christmas, Kenyon is drawing three times a day for prizes of $200 to $100,000. Today's Kenyon winners are Margaret Nelson Trail, Mr. C. Karen Coloma, and E.G. Woodland Victoria. You can help the handicapped of all ages in D.C. by getting your Kenwin tickets now. And a Merry Christmas to you all. Webster is next on BCTV. <laughs> Good morning. I see where our wishy-washy Human Rights Commission has been chivied into taking a real good close look at the Ku Klux Klan after a complaint was lodged, I think for a second time, by the Black Solidarity Association. Now let me make it perfectly clear, as somebody once said, the aims and objects of the Ku Klux Klan are despicable, and no right-minded person would have anything to do with them whatsoever. But at the same time, too much fuss can be made of these situations. And too many people are too quick to jump in with both feet and try and heat up what is really a fairly simple situation. The Ku Klux Klan is unlikely in this part of the world to gain any real solid number of adherents. And when these other organizations with the best will in the world, such as the People's Front Against Racism and Fascist Violence. Start the parades down to the courthouse, they're asking for trouble. What happens in our society now is that a TV event can so easily and quickly become some form of public trouble. And I would like to remind people of a couple of things. First of all, of the Human Rights Branch really had researched the subject, they would know what to say. Now, in Britain and in the United States, there is more or less unrestricted freedom to parade for any obnoxious cause, with the net result, as happened in Britain over the weekend, there are a thousand mounted policemen and foot policemen out to control and protect a, a rally of 400 National Front Movement hysterical people. In Canada, we have a criminal code which says that everyone who, by communicating statements in any public place, incites hatred against any identifiable group where such incitement is likely to lead to a breach of the peace, is guilty of an indictable offense and can go to the bucket for two years maximum. This is a kind of delicate nuance between Canada and the United States and Britain. Now, when our Charter of Rights comes in, when our Bill of Rights comes in, as propositioned by the Liberal government and supported by some civil libertarians, this will come out of our criminal code. And we will then go back to the situation whereby anybody can say anything at any time until a breach of the peace or until violence has happened. I happen to be one of the people who think that this particular section of the criminal code is a good thing. 
If I came on the air today and advocated, for instance, to be, you know, extrapolate to the nth degree that we have gas chambers for all 60-year-old Scotchmen, I should be charged and sent to jail for that kind of extremist statement. And I would like to see us keep this section of the criminal code where it can be used in sanity in a democracy. And those who incite hatred liable to cause a breach of the peace should be charged and convicted. Remember that when they're discussing the probabilities of a Bill of Rights, which will do much, in fact, to change the administration of our law. I know that many Supreme Court judges don't agree with me. They don't want to lose their clout in their hand. And when you're thinking about the Ku Klux Klan or anybody else, remember, it's the function and the duty of the Attorney General of this province, and the Attorney Generals all haven't always done their duty, as I'll remind you later this morning, to take action under the criminal code. And that the parading and anti-parading and pro-parading is something of which the media, yours truly included, must maintain a sense of balance and sanity and not create the riots by our very coverage of what at the moment are minor situations. Well, I hope that makes sense. It does to me anyway, even if it doesn't to you. Now, what have we got on for today? I'm going to have to be in my very best behavior with a Canadian television institution called Man Alive. Roy Bonnestiel. I'm going to have to tread very delicately and lightly with another British Columbia institution, the Gordon Gibson, the old fella, the bull of the woods. And I'm going to try and see what I can find out this morning what's happening inside ICBC with Fred Trotter, president of local, what's it, 387? 378. 378, almost right of the Office Technical and Employees Union. First for ICBC after the break. The people of British Columbia were sent into a state of shock last week by Tommy Holmes and the ICBC with their minimum increases of 38% and their big boo-boo when they withdrew in very short order the cancellation of the 25% discount for those over 65. But that's not the only trouble on the horizon. With me is Fred Trotter, the president of Local 378 of the OTEU, who's going to tell me this morning, are you not, Mr. Trotter, that there is a very sound possibility of an ICBC-wide strike by your 2,200 employees? Well, Jack, I hope not, and that's one of the reasons I came on this program. Uh, first of all, uh, I think that uh, the fact that we represent people in the public sector, we have a responsibility to the people in this province to come on to outline uh, what we have attempted to do to try and resolve this dispute without it reaching those proportions. Oh, now, just a minute now. You are a union leader, and the object of your exercise is to milk the public service employer for as much as possible for shorter work weeks, for better conditions, better vacation pay, less work and more money. That's right. your responsibility. Jack, I thought we'd get around to that kind of... Uh, Intro introduction sooner or later. Uh, I think our job is to try and get a reasonable and fair settlement. Uh, Mr. Holmes has said that that's what IC ICBC intend to do. That's what we want. The only thing is we believe there's a better forum than for ICBC simply to tell us what is fair and reasonable. Fair and enough. Are you suggesting they're not negotiating? Did uh, they not just increase your wage package up to 23 something percent over two years? Jack, what I'm saying is that uh, ICBC negotiates from the point of dictating. Uh, they dictate to the body shop what they will receive, and I'm not trying to make any judgment in the rightness or wrongness of the body sh shop's demand, but they do exactly the same thing with the employees. They attempt to dictate what is fair and reasonable. I think that each of us uh, should have the right to get into a, a fair forum to uh, hear the merits of the respective positions. And uh, that is our endeavor, is that we want a fair hearing for the employees in ICBC. Are you telling me that you don't sit across the table with a management group and negotiate back and forward? Oh, that's, that's quite true. But when it comes down to the crunch issues, those decisions, in my view, are not made across that table. They're made by whom? The They're cabinet? They're made in the back rooms, and I can't tell you whether they end up in the cabinet or in the boardroom of ICBC. Now, right at the moment, you've got a breakdown, correct? That's correct. Is that breakdown because the union put on an overtime ban? Yes. Uh, well, I assume so. Uh, what happened is that 
when negotiations broke down and we started uh, strike action, be at that same time we asked the Minister of Labour to consider the appointment of an Industrial Inquiry Commission Sounds to reasonable. make non-binding recommendations. We also asked the corporation to join in that application to the Minister of Labour. They rejected uh, that request for a joint application. Thirdly, we asked the corporation uh, uh, if they would agree to another third party coming in with the same terms of reference as an Industrial Inquiry Commission. They have rejected that offer. We also tried to meet with Mr. Holmes privately uh, to outline our concerns. Uh, Mr. Holmes to date has only heard uh, our position relayed to him by members of his negotiating committee and we wanted the opportunity to meet him directly uh, to express our, our uh, position. I can understand his reluctance because the moment he meets with you he cuts down the authority of his negotiating group. No, I disagree, Jack. I think that uh, Mr. Holmes is sitting in the position of making decisions and he, uh, in making those decisions, should know exactly what the union is talking about. He should not be relying on uh, uh, information relayed to him by a third party. We don't want to negotiate with him. We only want him to hear our position. You don't think he's being told the full story? Well, I, I have no reason to believe he would. Because Question. Have you had a vote yet among your membership and what's on the table? Uh, what is on the table has not been voted on by the membership. Uh, we took the uh, previous offer to the uh, membership, and that was voted and rejected by 92%. Uh, mail, uh, was that a meeting? Uh, that was an authorized strike vote meeting under the Labor Relations Board. Now, uh, you mean everybody voted? That's right. Everybody in the union voted? That's right. What was the vote? 92%. Of 2,200? Yeah, that's right. Now, oh. when I say 92, that's all the people who elected to go to the meetings or uh, send in ballots, okay? Uh, yeah, 92% of a proportion right. of your membership. Right. What proportion of your membership? Well, a good proportion, Jack. We don't release... 51% you know, oh, no, or 96%? No, no, uh, I'm not going to get into that. We, it was a good uh, membership vote. Next question. How much money have they offered you? Uh, they have indicated that their offer in the first year is worth somewhere around 11.5%, 8 to 11.5%, and, .5%, and uh, it's 9 to 11% uh, in the second year. So that's 17 to 22%, roughly speaking, for certain categories. Right. Okay, don't need to go into the details on that. Uh, but you have already, you said, taken strike action. What strike action is that? The withdrawal of overtime? The only action we brought into play is we uh, banned overtime within the corporation. And uh, we did that about the 6th of November. And they took action and too. And on the 14th of November, uh, they elected to lock out 33 members, of which about half a dozen refused overtime, had refused overtime. Now, as far as we're concerned, that was punitive. Uh, to take select out 33 out of the 2,200 who were all banning overtime was punitive. Uh, in addition to that, I think it was to cause us to escalate the dispute. Yeah, they wanted to precipitate a major dispute. I'm prepared to believe that, but let me get this clear. You banned overtime on the 6th. Right. And on the 14th, in one section only, where six had refused to work overtime, they locked out 33 they people. They locked out 33 Which people. section is that? Headquarters? Uh, no, it's in the data capture uh, area, is the area they refer to. Tell in me. the main building. I, I, I wasn't very down. impressed with Mr. Holmes when he was on the other day when he couldn't, for instance, give me comparisons about what I see, what insurance is costing in the rest of the country. First time any official has come here on a rate increase without uh, that information. Is it a competent organization or is it badly run? Well, that's a second uh, point that I'm prepared to note from our point of view. We believe that the corporation's policy and attitude towards their employees uh, is such that it is causing uh, the corporation to have to ask for those massive increases. We believe that if the corporation... Give me that again, I lost you on that. Well, we believe that their policy, Jack, and attitude towards employees, uh, personnel development, is uh, increasing the costs of the operation of ICBC. You mean they don't run it well? In the area of uh, employee administration that we're uh, knowledgeable of, and the answer to that is no, they don't, and it's costing you money. Uh, i give you an example. 
at present, and, and by the way, we don't have the, any 1980 financial statements for the corporation, mm -hmm. and we haven't seen any uh, uh, actual budget for 1981. But uh, looking at the uh, amount of money for on the premium dollar, which goes to 2,200 members, using our 1980 rates and comparing that back to uh, their 1979 revenue, it's 7.3% on the premium dollar. What do you mean for employee benefits and... And wages. Well, listen okay. a minute. With these increases of 38 okay. to 70%, you're going to go down to 4 cents no. on the dollar. Yeah, it, we, we anticipate less than 6 cents on the dollar. Now, those employees, especially the 900 in the claim centers, are the ones who can control how that money is spent on claims. 76 to 77% is spent on claims. And we believe that if there's proper development, proper training, a proper attitude towards employees, that you would find that those costs, and that $69 million, would have been substantially less. Okay, hold your breath. How long before we have a strike, full scale? Uh, Jack, we're into a strike situation right now. The withdrawal of savages. Uh, I'm going to tell you that from the point of view of the union, we don't intend to take that action. I hope that the corporation is responsible enough not to take it as well. Okay, more with Fred Trotter, 378 OTEU, after the break. Fred Trotter is the, the president of Local 378 of the OTEU, which is involved in what could be a very grave dispute. Although the news is good, you don't plan to withdraw services for some considerable time yet. That's, that's correct, Jack, but I think... Because that, that would be a strike against the public. There are indications, though, that the corporation may endeavor to escalate this dispute. Well, didn't the corporation give you an offer that the employees could go back to work providing that they'd work overtime on a certain Saturday and you'd lift a ban and agree to put the corporation's offer to your members for a vote? Yeah. The corporation uh, made us an offer the other day that they would take back the 33 people they saw fit to lock out right if we would agree that the 33 would work the Saturday shift on overtime and uh, lift our overtime ban and take their last offer to the membership uh, we didn't consider that a very attractive offer so what did you counter offer? well we made a counter offer to them we suggested to them that yes we would let the 33 33 could go back anytime by the way Jack that they want to take them back because they locked them out uh, the 33 can go back to work. They can work the Saturday shift. We will lift our overtime ban, provided the dispute goes to a mediator. That mediator is one we recommended, one who is previously involved with ICBC in the first dispute. He's knowledgeable of ICBC. Who is it? It's uh, Dr. Noel Hall. Was, oh, yeah, from was, the university. That's right. And he's a respected mediator. He never gave us everything we wanted in the first uh, agreement, and certainly... Uh, uh, we think he's knowledgeable, he'd make non-binding recommendations, and we agreed that we would place that in front of the membership for a vote. There's a freeze generally in government hiring. Is it a freeze in ICBC hiring? I can't answer that question. Uh, don't they, don't, they don't uh, inform us of their policies. Haven't your people said that you're very short of staff, short of adjusters in some of the claim centers? Jack, we've got, this is one of the things interrelated with this dispute. ICBC has attempted to say it's only wages. There's about four major issues involved in this. Uh, there is the uh, working situation in claims. There is also vacations. There's a real... You want more vacations. Right. Realignment of the hours of work and wages. Those are the four principal items. Well, you don't want to shorten your work week from no. below 35 No, days. It's, there's no change in the You're on a 35-hour work week. That's correct. Four-day week. No, that's the, uh, we work a nine-day fortnight in claims only. In the head office, those individuals get eight days off uh, as opposed to the nine-day fortnight, and it's a very divisive thing and unfair to those uh, uh, 1,100, 1,200 people. Just a minute. Now, some work a nine-day fortnight and some work what? That, some work... Uh, well, an eight-day fortnight. They, no, they work uh, a straight five-day week. They get an extra eight days off a year. That's oh. not a nine-day. A nine-day fortnight would provide 17 days. If you uh, integrate, don't integrate the stats, it's 20. How do you want it? Do you want to alter the nine-day fortnight? We want we want the claims to stay as it is. Nine-day fortnight. And we want the others to go to a nine-day fortnight with the with the stat holidays integrated. 
What does a girl get to start at the lowest grade in OTEU right now, okay. straight out of high school? What do they start at? Well, the starting rate in ICBC right at the moment, uh, and I'm going to give you round dollars, is right. $930 a month. Not bad. Well, that's an eighteen year old. Six, that's six dollars an hour, Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, you know You see the, the non government just, employee just minute, let me, still finds just, it hard to understand the apparently high yeah. levels of government jobs. Just a minute, let me come back if you want to mention the wages. Sure. I, uh, we want to get into this uh, claim staff, I think is what you referred to earlier. Right. But uh, in terms of wages, I just point out that we've got nine hundred people who earn between nine hundred and thirty and thirteen hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. 900, which is getting up uh, pretty close to uh, half of the bargaining unit. Certainly and do a lot better a starting on the BC ferries, I'll tell you. Well, I have no, I don't, can't answer that question. <laughs> okay. The other thing that I would point out is that, uh, you know, the uh, employees in ICBC in the last four agreements, mm -hmm. four years, I should say, received 7.3%, mm -hmm. 6%, mm -hmm. 5 and 3 quarters percent, mm -hmm. 6 and a half percent. That's a total of 28%. The consumer price index has gone up 42.9%. There's a 15% gap in there. Fred, where the public is suspicious, and I'm not being nasty to you about it, is that we think we're going to pay anyway. It's the public employee who gets the biggest slice of the taxpayer's pie on every occasion, isn't it? Well, that is true, but I hope uh, it's looked at in the context that if if it's properly done, that we're giving you a good service in terms of uh, the insurance corporation. And I say if it's properly... Uh, well, why do they want you to work uh, overtime? Uh, I think it relates into the whole staffing problem. Bad management. I, in Lack that, of proper in training. In that area, I say it is uh, okay. bad management. If I can sum up, one, money is no real problem. You'll come money is a negotiable item. Two, you want better uh, vacations. vacations. Three, you want action now on some form of mediation with such as Noel Hall and the withdrawal of the overtime ban and you'll, go, you'll tell all your people they're free to work overtime. Right. And that's about it. What's the fourth one? Well, the fourth we had, I mentioned the hours of work alignment. Oh, but yeah. We've got, we want a better commitment from the corporation in terms of this work situation in claims, which I believe is costing you money. When you say work situ situation and claims, you mean it's badly organized? Yes. Sin Adjusters not well enough trained? That's right. We have since uh, right from 1975, 76, and it's continued on, and we have evidence of it that there has not been the proper development and training of claim staff. Uh, there has not, uh, uh, they have, the workload has been such that those people have been terminating. They leave, and, and if they continue to leave, you're going to ha be in a worse position deficit-wise in the future. What kind of turnover do you have in staff in, in ICBC I, ca I can't answer that. Uh, generally speaking, it runs fairly high in, in any uh, white-collar uh, type bargaining unit. But uh, in claims, uh, to give you an example, uh, it would not take very many people to seriously affect the uh, claims operation. Your, uh, your overtime ban must be affecting the service to the public right it, now. I would have to assume so. Okay, all you need now, what you, is what you want now, a meeting with Holmes, an understanding of the situation, the appointment of a mediator acceptable to both of you, or an industrial inquiry commissioner, and you'll lift the ban and go back to work. That's right, but uh, even the, the Holmes issue is not a, you know... You just want to point out that the heat man doesn't negotiate with the union. If he doesn't want to talk to us, uh, I guess we'll live with Fred, that. Fred, I'm grateful for your explanation and understanding. Who knows, somebody might want to come on from ICBC tomorrow. Although I don't think we can take them tomorrow. My thanks to Fred Trotter, president of Local 378 of the Office Technical and Employees Union. What a switch now. Man alive, after the break. I gotta tell you, Roy Bonestell looks much older in real life than he does on his long-running, excellent CBC series, Man Alive. When did we first meet Roy? I think it was around 65, Jack. I remember bringing uh, Jim Muchmore down to, uh, to your radio show. Former and, moderator and of the United right. Church of Canada. And I was a little afraid, you know, because I thought you were going to tear him in pieces. 
And uh, he told me it was the most wonderful experience he ever had. And you phoned me back afterwards and said, bring this chap down any time because I love meeting him. They've been lucky, you know. Yeah. What is man's chief end? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that because I'm, I'm not as uh, theologically inclined you as ask, you are. You okay, what me. is man's chief end, Jack? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forevermore. Amen. From Tremendous. grade one in a public school in you Glasgow where I learned the shorter <laughs> catechism off by heart and if you like now I'll do you the Twelve Commandments. Press Twelve Commandments! <laughs> <laughs> You've got two more than I ever heard of. <laughs> right, no, it really is. Uh, I don't normally come into a program laughing and giggling because of a guest, you know. Right. But uh, I've watched you mm. endlessly mm -hmm. and I know you've got lots of time to produce your lovely polished little program, <laughs> you know, once a week, nothing to it, and that you have 180 taxpayers' employees I'm who do all so. the work for I'm you. I'm afraid so, yeah. I just sit there and look pretty. Were you a religious person when you started this program? No, and I can't reasonably say that I am now. I started out as a broadcaster, as you know, and... Um, On I WX? Uh, before that, actually, I was in CKTV in St. Catharines, Ontario, but I came out to WX for a while. But the thing was that I was bored by the religious programming we had on the air. The ratings would go down every time a, a minister came on the air, and I thought, there must be some way that we can make religious programming interesting. And so that's how I got into the kind of programming I was doing when I met you in 65. And then you became a sensation seeker on television. Oh, it's not sensation seeker. Do you believe the Shroud of Turin, which I watched you at yeah, great length, yeah. do you believe the Shroud of Turin, in fact, images the body of Christ? I would, I believe it does, you know. I, I've really never said this before, but I really believe it does. The important thing is that nobody's disproved that it isn't. And they've had scientists working on this for years. They cannot disprove the fact that it is the burial shroud of Christ. I, frankly, I don't think it makes any difference whether it is or whether it isn't. Of course it does. No, it doesn't at all. That's not if you had a legitimate relic which showed some supernatural remnant of mm. the man who is yeah. regarded as the savior, it would be like... If the image is put on there in a supernatural way, yes. <clears throat> now, I don't know whether that's true or not, and we won't know until they do some carbon-14 testing on the thing, which they haven't allowed. I thought they'd torn little bits off and tested it. Not, not for carbon-14, which is the only way they can date it within 50 or 100 years. But that's the one test that hasn't been allowed in that shroud yet. Now, when you did that program, mm -hmm. did you do the traveling yourself yes, to oh yeah, yeah. Rome and yes, Turin? Yes, yes. We had six million people in the little town of Turin gathering in this cathedral to see the shroud. And the important thing was not whether it was real or whether it wasn't real. The important thing was seeing the devotion on these people that crowded in there from all over the world to see it on display for the first time in 32 years. So therefore it wasn't the scientific fact or examination which convinced you it was real, it was the devotion of the people who crowded into the... I think that's a fair guess, yeah. I think that's fair. Well, I'm not going to guess about your belief. You tell <laughs> me yes or no. I've also studied the scientific evidence. I was there with a group of scientists and nobody has disproved it. It could very well be. See, but to me personally, I don't care. It was a great program. I liked it very you much. You do care. No, I don't really. I mean, if you, if you have faith in something, you have faith whether it's proven or disproven. You now have faith. In terms of the shroud, it could be the... the Are you a born-again Christian? No, heavens no. Are you a Christian? I wouldn't even call myself that. I think a Christian is somebody who, um, who follows the word of, uh, of his leader, who happens to be Christ, and follows it every day of his life. And I can't honestly say I do that. I think it's presumptuous for a person to call themselves Christian. Back to my little annoying theme that you're a sensation seeker in the field of religion yeah. hmm? and allied endeavors. <laughs> what about um, uh, vision of death by people who mm -hmm. came back? Now, that was another one of your yeah, programs yeah. I saw with that woman. Right. Kubler Ross. Kubler Ross. Yeah. Give me the case for believing that there's an afterlife based mm. on what happened to someone who was at the edge of the grave. Well, first of all, we have thousands and thousands of cases of people who talk about, quote, dying and then coming back to life. They, ex they explain it almost in the exact same words, that at the moment of some death, so-called death, they have an out-of-the-body experience. They can rise up and they can look down and see the deathbed or they can see the accident scene. They go through the similar kind of experiences. They go through a long, dark tunnel that has a light at the far end. And um, they come to this point, and they have to make a decision whether to go on or to come back. If something very strong is pulling them back, they return back into this life. Now, that kind of scene has been told by thousands and thousands of people. And people like Dr. Kubler-Ross believe that this is proof Again, of an afterlife. there can be no proof of it, because as you and I both know, I meet as a matter of routine, I have met as a matter of routine over the past 20 years, 
nuts who have traveled endlessly in flying saucers around the world mm -hmm. and seen them and spoken to them and talked to them and touched them. And it's a creation of their uh, mind, sure. Sure. an illusion. That's right. And a lot of doctors believe that there is a residual mental activity that's going on after uh, or, or the great trauma of, of uh, near-death experience, and that this is what's giving them this kind of hallucination or vision. But here again, Jack, the important thing <coughs> to me is not whether there's life after death. I mean, I, I can wait and find out. I don't get terribly excited by this. Love your calm, detached attitude. Listen, I'm much more concerned what happens during life than I am to what happens after death. This is what's important, is what we do here in this life. You are now a minister, officially. No, I'm not. You're a doctor of divinity. Okay, that's an honorary degree. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and honorary. A, a doctor of la letters. That's right, yeah. And you yeah. dropped out of high school. Well, I could, yeah, well, it was a good, I dropped out of high school when I was 17. We're gonna get some opinions from you after the break. Right. I'm going to have time to take a few calls to uh, Roy Bonner, Steel Man Alive, because I'm sure that you'd like to get at him for whatever he is. <laughs> but uh, one thing that bothers me is this revival of, should I say this? What? Fundamental. Fundamentalism, yes. That worries me. Is that not an indication that too many people are panicking? I think I think you're like against you're right. established religion. I think you're right. I think they are. They're looking for something they're not finding in the established churches. I also suspect it might be kind of a backlash from the idealistic '60s mm -hmm. and early '70s that we had, where the churches were out on picket lines and the churches uh, were doing all sorts of avant-garde things, social issues, which turned people off. Of uh, that's right. One of the things that you dealt with, of course, was the World Council of Churches that's supplying right. money for guerrillas that's right. to kill white men in the old uh, Rhodesia. And a lot of people got very upset by that. They're going back to a much more personal kind of religion, a much more emotional kind, and I must add, I think, an anti-intellectual kind of religion. They're all out for personal salvation, and of course, our TV evangelists are doing a lot to encourage this, too. You well, know. you're a TV evangelist. I'm not a TV evangelist. I'm not proselytizing. I'm not no, but you anybody. could say, put your hand on that television set and send me money, and I'll cure you of all your ails, and millions of Canadians would believe you. If I did that, Jack, I'd make so much money I could buy you in the station, for heaven's sakes. I know you could. The the whole Should we have a law against people sending money to radio and television programs? The only kind of thing you could do is, I suppose, get them on false advertising. What else can you do? Not a bad idea. That's basically what they're doing. They're saying if you, if you accept Christ as your personal savior, you're going to be rich, you're going to be successful, you're going to be handsome and great, and it doesn't work that way. Yet, on the other hand, all about. I'm sure you, you've been described, for instance, as, said Webster, mm -hmm. reading from the cover of the mm -hmm. book. Yeah. The most charming, intelligent, and empathetic interviewer since Ed Murrow. Well, that's true. <laughs> Does it say humble, too? Or? No. no that's the same. He has invented the painless sermon that deals with issues that somehow never quite make it to the what pulpit. What we've tried to do in Man Alive. Yeah, what you do you try to do? What we've do tried to do is. Apart from seeking sensation. No sensation. We're exploring issues. Shroud of sure. Turin, life okay. after okay. death before you die. We're investigating. We're an investigative reporter in the field of religion. We're not trying to tell the people. Royal we? I'm talking about the whole, it takes more than one person to do a television God, show. God, I didn't you know made, that. You didn't know no, that. No, I didn't know that. I happen to be up front and I get all the praise and I get all the blame when the show goes down the Don't grade. tell me it's on a teleprompter. <laughs> don't <laughs> tell me it's on a teleprompter. I don't Please don't tell me it's on a teleprompter. <laughs> I notice you don't have any. Listen, my next contract, I've got to have 90 minutes on a teleprompter. Good idea. Yeah. All you need are good writers and that's what we lack in this and business. And good ad-libbers. Good ad-libbers. You're all right for that. No problem. I was going to ask you something. What was okay. it? Faith healing. Oh, mm. I was about to say to you that there is something to the laying on of hands. Oh, I think so. And there is something to faith healing. Yet just a moment ago, you were knocking it. I'm not knocking faith healing. I think that a person uh, can go into a hospital, for example, and be very, very ill. And if they can get the, their mind in gear and can psych themselves up, they can likely overcome that illness. But you're not going to go in there with a broken leg and have it healed. You're not going to go in with terminal cancer and have it healed. And no. this, is, this is my complaint about faith healers, where they get people to withdraw from their medication and they die, for heaven's sakes. I remember once with, uh, when Oral Roberts was in town, I was on radio. You might have been around then, going behind the green scheme and mm -hmm. watching the poor people fall out of their wheelchairs and not being able to get back in again. These are the people they don't show on camera, Jack. Mm -hmm. The camera pans quickly off somebody like that. Mm. All they want to see is the wham on the forehead and the boxing. All right, what do, wh wh who's the most evocative religious spokesman you've ever met, met in your life? And I presume we're not just talking about Christians. 
I would say Lev Cell. Lev Cell is a. Don't Jew. even know how to spell it. No, oh, it's in the book. Lev Cell is a, is a Jew, poet. He went through Buchenwald and Dachau, and saw his parents thrown into the into the furnace during World War II, and he now talks about faith and hope and compassion and caring in a world where he finds very little, and this man has a faith that couldn't be shaken. Now, you know. Even by that experience. Even by that. Even by that. I'm awfully He's sorry. That All right. I've never um, even heard of him. And I'd have got, I oh, Eli, Eli, Eli Wiesel. Eli Wiesel. Okay. <laughs> e -I -E That's good. Wiesel, W-I-E-S-E-L. That's, -E right. That's good. I just wanted to get uh, the witness. Man. And then you have a Mother Teresa in India. Well, Mother All Teresa right. can attempt to be off a little bit, I gotta tell you. Well, maybe she does. But I mean, here's a woman who isn't going around trying to make better Christians. She's trying to make Muslims better Muslims, Hindus better Hindus. She doesn't proselytize. She doesn't ram a religion down your throat. She's a living example of faith. Surely you've realized now that socialism is the answer, that any form of capitalism, capitalism, does not deal with the poor people properly. You want to talk about that for about oh, 20 minutes? I to answer my question. Any good Christian agree. must be agree. an egalitarian socialist of some kind. I suppose to a certain extent, yes. I mean, we had an but evangelist on last year who said, all Christians are wealthy. You don't have to be poor to be a Christian. No, I know, I know. That's like the Bill Bright, was it? He no, said, well, God never meant us to go second class. That's Robert, Robert Taylor. Robert Taylor. Oh, Robert Taylor, yeah, yeah. This is the feeling that bothers me about the evangelist today. Back to my question. Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> that to be a dedicated believer in or religion, whether it's Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, or you must be some form of egalitarian socialist because like Jesus' followers, you will divest yourself of material properties That's right. and follow him. That's right. So if that's socialism, you're, actually, you're absolutely right. That's Very difficult for a rich man to enter I remember when I was a kid in the Depression. You're in trouble, Jack. When I, who said I was a Christian? <laughs> I said a rich man. Who said I'm a believer in egalitarian <laughs> socialism? I don't know. But I remember when I was a kid in Glasgow, we used to be a we used little crippled girls mm -hmm. on the back of horse-drawn coal carts yeah. to evangelize for Christian communism. That's right. That's right. I suppose they had something yeah. in those days. How would like you some, like to take some calls, Roy? Sure, fine. Man alive, <coughs> himself, in person, no charge, you don't have to send money. On the telephone, <laughs> after the break. <laughs> Couple of instant comments. What do you think of Bob McClure, I Robert admire, McClure? I admire him greatly. The first lay moderator of the United Church of Canada. I've traveled many, many miles with the man. A very simple, honest, and dedicated man, and I just think he's incredible. Still going strong, as he, as he says. You know, I, I keep saying, "When are you going to quit?" You know, you've been you've been going your whole life in, in the mission field and traveling. And he said, "Oh, they'll tell me when the tread's gone. I'll quit when I." When he's I fantastic. Have to Much climb. more. I, you go, I go back a long way with much more, you know. He was uh, against, he was against booze, he was against bingo, and he was against blondes. That was how we used to <laughs> categorize him. But um, a very sincere man. He was, he was much like uh, Mugridge in that sense because he was Mugridge. A, he was a, okay, the black and white kind of thinking. The world's going to hell in a handbasket type of thing. And uh, you either have to be one or the other. They don't believe in grays, these people, but tremendous honest to their own selves. Abortion. I think abortion is a very bad thing to use uh, as, a, as a remedy for birth control, for example, and yet there are certainly cases, I think, where women, because of, uh, of, of rape or because of uh, health problems, should be allowed to have abortion. Or well, yes. because of def def defect in the fetus? Uh, yes, I believe they should, yes. That's why I think we have things like amniocentesis to find out. Listen, there's a story in the paper this morning, mm -hmm. if it's true, and you and I know you can't believe what you read in the papers, about a little retarded boy who suddenly produced the incredible ability to play the piano without yeah, knowledge of music. I know, I know. And the Sandra Diamonds that I talk about in the book and a lot of people. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? It sure does. And it's uh, not being a woman, I don't think I have a right to answer that. Listen, what about some calls to Roy Bonestill? Where am I? Can't see the note. From Kelowna, go ahead to Roy Bonestill. Yeah? Yeah, speak up. Uh, I have two things I'd like to ask Mr. Bonestill. Right. First, on um, uh, when you you know the death the moment of death experience when you come back, yes. it's never been mentioned that uh, usually if you communicate with someone, 
you uh, talk to someone that is already dead, like in your family or that. That's right. And my other thing is, on his program he had on the Indian people where he uh, had the, the sh growing stones, you know, where they, the stones produce another stone? That's right. Have those ever been studied by science? Now I'll hang up and listen to your answer. Mm. Okay, second one first. The, um, the stones have never been, been uh, studied by science, to my knowledge, and Ernest Tatusis, who is the possessor of these stones, uh, has offered them if anyone wants to study them, but as far as I know, no one ever has. These are stones that he carries around, and they have little stones. They, they keep increasing over the years. He goes, all right, all right. It's, uh, I saw them with my own eyes. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't see them having little stones. I didn't see them having little stones, but I took his word for it. He's a fine chief of the Poundmaker Reserve up in Saskatchewan. He's a great man. To realize if the, if the Savior returned on earth today, how we'd treat him. Oh, my heavens. What would we do with him? We'd likely crucify him. No, we'd, we'd put him on administered welfare, <laughs> wouldn't we? <laughs> Maybe we'd put him on a talk show. It'd be a great idea. I'm sorry, the, the first question I forget. I don't remember. I wasn't listening. Oh, dear. What was that about? Um, you oh, sweat. Oh, us talking to people after death. We always talk to dead people. Oh, come off it. I talk I to my know. mother all the time up in the corner of the room. Well, I guess people can do You that. think I'm joking? I can hear her saying, Jack, don't do that! I don't believe in communication with the dead, if, that's the, if that was what the question was. No. Okay. You don't believe in spiritualism? Not particularly, no. Time for a funny story? Sure. I went once to a spiritualist seance in Vancouver with a German woman from North Vancouver, mm -hmm. and I pretended to be her husband. <laughs> so the German woman went up first, and this little spiritualist medium yeah. produced, first of all, her mother. Right. right? So back in the corner, came out again. But then I went up. So she says to me, the medium disappears and comes back and says, Uh huh. I have found your Grossmutter, <laughs> thinking I was German. And I said to him, She came out, Wie geht's, Grossmutter? <laughs> and then I burst out laughing, because I don't have any German Grossmutter. We, we, we filmed the seance one time, the, the entire <laughs> seance, and um, the, the table moved, it smashed around the place, things bounced up and down. And we ran back because this was great film. Took it back, there wasn't a thing on it. The whole thing was blank. It was filmed by one of the best cameramen in the CBC. I was, I was concerned about that, worried about it. Go ahead. Do you believe it happened? Something happened. You hadn't been drinking? Not a drop. No. You don't drink? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're shattering all our illusions, Roy. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the, it's the media, you see. It builds up this image of... Um, you me. come on here often enough and I'll shatter you completely. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead from what is it, Kamloops? Yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering if you'd had any, uh, or heard of any information or new information on uh, topics like Cal Lindsay's late great planet Earth and, you know, sort of modern news stories and tie in with... Good question. Revelation. That's it, all you can ask. Okay, I talked to Hal Lindsay about a month ago. He sold 18 million copies of this book saying the world is coming to an end. And this, of course, is how he, uh, he makes his money. He's convinced that what's happening today in the world ties in with biblical prophecy and that indeed the world, he says we have one more decade, we have ten more years and everything's going to blow up. Uh, Hal Lindsey personally is a very personable chap. I, I enjoyed meeting him, but I think he's uh, way off the beam. Did Joshua command the sun to stand still? I don't think so. We wouldn't be here if he had. We'd have gone flying into space. Go ahead, please. Um, yeah, Mr. Webster. Well, Dr. Bonnesteel is with Mr. Webster this morning, yes. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Um, yes, I'd like to speak with Mr. Bonesteel. I just wanted to say that um, I feel that what you, what Mr. Webster is to Vancouver, that Mr. Bonesteel is to the rest of Canada, he's one heck of an investigative reporter. He can get all the facts, and he doesn't stand for any, uh, any here, run here. around. Praise is enough. You don't need lots of praise. <laughs> You nice to hear from my brother. You got <laughs> what are you, you're from St. Catharines. Uh, Ontario, Trenton, old UEL stock. Bonnesteel, Bonnesteel, uh, Bonnesteel. Uh, what's the origin of that name? Bonnesteelen, it's German, actually. Bonnesteel, yeah, you know, So they tell me. You yeah. look a wee bit. We came over here uh, around 1600 or so. Yeah, you know, know what I mean? <laughs> I know what I mean. Can't say these things nowadays. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. Um, I'd like to say that I'm a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. And um, I'd like to know if uh, Mr. Bonsteel has ever heard of Kenneth E. Hagen. Uh, that's a gentleman that when he was um, 16, the doctor said that he would never live, he would never get out of bed. And uh, he started reading the Bible and started believing the Bible. And uh, after 16 months of bed 
No, I've never heard of Mr. Hagen. On, on the other hand, it sounds like a fascinating program. I think we'll get our researchers on it. It would be a good show. It would be a good yeah, show, wouldn't it? Very good, yes. Many researchers do you have? Just two. Oh, just two. Just two, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Funny noise on the phone this morning. Bump, bump. Maybe we'll begin to fade with because we're making yes. fun of the supernatural. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Right now? Yes, right now. Okay. Um, Mr. Bonstill. Yes. Mr. Bonstill? Yes, yes. Okay. Do you, do you think there's any um, fundamental difference between, uh, say, a Jim Jones and the apparent control that he has over people, um, and even the religious function that, say, a Billy Graham and or an Oral Roberts would have in terms of... Um, Good question. Yeah. Good question. The that most of their followers have, the singularity of the ideas, etc. Well, I, I think it's pretty obvious the difference between Jim Jones and Billy Graham. I think Jim Jones uh, had such a messianic complex that uh, the people that he gathered around him in this cult of his, uh, only only death could sort of separate them. And this this is what happened in the in the jungles of Guyana. Uh, Billy Graham was uh, much different. He sees that his mission in life is to go into all the world and spread the gospel. He's, he's all the comfortable world and spread the gospel in thousand dollar suits. Okay, Jack, that's your interpretation of it, and there are times I tend to agree, but uh, I, I have no fault with the Billy Graham. I, th I, I have no fault with, with the evangelists, uh, except when they use my medium of television to raise money by sending out tokens and selling pictures and, and, and uh, for their own aggrandizement. Roy, I hope it's not 20 years before I meet you again or whenever uh, it was. About 20 uh, years. It's a good book, they tell me. I haven't read it yet. In Search of Man Alive. You'll enjoy have it. Have you seen the book? You'll enjoy it. Let them see the book. You'll enjoy it. Of course, sir. <laughs> Very kind of you, Jack. Thank you very much. Now look at his face in real life. <laughs> Give us a shot of his face in real life. Back to the book again. Uh, a face again. You're incredible. Face again. You uh, do look old. I had, I had makeup there. on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My thanks, Roy. Nice Most to see enjoyable. you. Thanks very much. Next, sir. another old friend of mine, Gordon Gibson. Looking forward to it after the break. Gordon Gibson, I've known him for many years indeed, and I hardly know where to start in an attempt to interview him about his book, Bull of the Woods. So for a start, let's forget all about his early days. He came from a family, a fine family of good people. In fact, I think I remember meeting your mother once at a house set, which was the family home on some inlet on Vancouver Island. Would yes. I be right in that? Yeah, you were right in that. And you'd, say, you'd behave yourself that particular day because Mother had that habit of making men, even as rough as you, be really gentlemen. Gordon, don't say that I'm a rough man compared to what you were in your heyday. A good man when I was around my mother, I would no more be a rough man than fly. I just respected her too much. You know, you've left your mark in this province in many ways, and I suppose we better get the the most important mark out of the way right enough. What was it that made you go on your crusade in the early 50s, and I hate to hound people, which resulted in an unfortunate cabinet minister whose name we don't even need to use, going to jail for five years? You at that time were a highly successful logger, highly successful, you invented a form of raft. What was it called? The Gibson raft. The Gibson raft. What was the, the spur that sent you on a campaign which saw you in and out of politics making enemies and friends by the thousands? Jack, and I want the whole world to know that that was the first real Watergate. It's a, the timber was owned about 90% by the people in this country, by the people of British Columbia. And by a devious means, of talking about forest preservation management. They talked about us being short of timber. That's We were then only cutting about five billion a year. We're now cutting three or four times that. They started to say we were short. Some of the big boys got together and they convinced the government that this was the right thing to do. But here is where the great harm was. The very men who were 
the leaders of industry then, started the same as my brothers and I. We were able to go and buy, put up for bid, a piece of timber, and if we worked hard and worked well, chose the right piece of timber, markets were right, we could Make get into business. Mm -hmm. We were our own bosses, could sell to anybody we chose. Along came a thing called forest management license. I had a member in the 50s, you complaining bitterly about the fact that the whole province of British Columbia had been sliced up with like a piece of pie, giving all the best and most accessible lumber to the big companies. That is true. There's only one thing they lied about. They said in there keep half for the other little man, which was the half without any timber on it, or the half that was not economical at that time to log. As a result of that, you got up in the legislature, I forget the year now, it would be 54 or 55. About 54, yeah. 54, and you said money talks in the issuing of forest management licenses. Yes, and that's all I said, and I meant a lot more. But they, the cap fit so perfectly that they threw me out. They could easily have ignored it, but they didn't. By through you, throwing you out, you mean you were, you were named three times by the Speaker of the Legislature and ejected from the House? I was the first man ever had that happen to, but I did have the good common sense to walk right up into the gallery. The press gallery. Press gallery. No, no, no. The public no, gallery. The public gallery, where the House is not allowed to continue. While a stranger in the House, you know that as well as I do. So they had to adjourn everything. They sent two policemen up to throw me out, but... Uh, I, I was in fairly good shape in those days, and uh, I uh, wasn't thrown out, would be a very good way of putting it, so they had to... Uh, adjourn the house. Adjourn the house. As a result of that money talk statement, which is, you don't go into an awful lot of detail in the book. You don't seem to be terribly bitter about how you were treated at the time. I'm not bitter about it for one good reason, Jack. It's passed. I had my day in court. I was re-elected. I took about three hours. And these were part of my statements. I said, there's a lot of you sitting across the floor of the House of the Government members that are lower than a snake's belly. You let one of your members, no more guilty than the rest of you, go to jail. Mm -hmm. And you took just as much of the pie as he took. Now. You were speaking That's all on, I want to you say. You were speaking on the overall responsibility of a government which at that time appeared to be giving favors to the big boys to detriment of the little guys. They were. And Jack, here is the only cruel part about it. If that had been all, that wouldn't be too bad. But that is still going on today. The government has complete power to charge one man twice as much as the other for the same timber if he doesn't kowtow to that particular government in power. You've got to divide it into two sections of Shirley Gordon Gibson. One, there was a specific situation in the 50s where there was graft and corruption. Hmm? Now you're saying that today the government has the administrative power, but it always does have. I mean, the governments can do what they like with our no, tax money. Jack, you're wrong. There was a time when things were put up for open bid, and the man who bid the highest got it. But surely that is gone. But surely you're not suggesting that we go back to putting all the timber in, pub, in the public arena and let anyone bid who wants for it. It is the same as the air or the water. It's public property. And I don't see why a young man today can't start exactly the same as my family did or any other company that got to be a fair size around here. They started small and became big. But that chance is not here anymore. Now, back to the, the famous case, of course. I remember when you made your first allegation of money talks, they set up a commission under a judge. I think it was Judge Art Lord. Yeah, that's right. That was one occasion when you wouldn't talk. You would not testify, as I recall, to the Lord Commission. Uh, Jack, you have to remember why. I would have then had to prove, which it took over five years after that, for the government with all their staff to prove that I was right. That money had spoken. That money, money had spoken and plenty of it. But the sad part is those who did paid the bribe, they retained their loot. You understand that? 
If the loot had been taken back, we could call this fair. But the loot is still there, still being operated, and All still right. a great problem. Once again, I'll be clinical on the subject. The man who took the bribe was found guilty yes. by the jury. The company right. which apparently gave the bribe, the jury disagreed in that. And yes. therefore, that company was never found guilty of giving the bribe. Nor were they charged. And don't let it think of where they recharge. No, and another thing, it wasn't just one company. It was a policy. It was the way you got things. It was not the way you parted you your hair or the color of your eyes. It was your favors with the government that got you that timber. Well, it must have, and later on, the lawyer David Sturdy, now dead, made other charges in front yeah. of a commission. Yes. Didn't you back Sturdy in that? I will have to say, the best way to say it is I did my best on that side of the fence, yes, because I knew he was right and the others were wrong. And it cost you a lot of money. I would say so, would be a good way of putting it. There wasn't any particular joy in your heart, but you obviously are such an unreconstructed free enterpriser that you still think today's system of tree farm licenses is still basically evil. It is absolutely evil because every man should be have an equal chance to start, not a chance to win, where we have different abilities, but every man ought to have the even, an even chance yet to start. Mm. And it is only now that, what happened when Ian Sinclair, one of our biggest men came out here? What happened? There's enough power in Victoria, he said, it's not for sale. Bennett said that. What Bennett meant was, I have so much power but that I'm even if you own it, I can force you out. Think of that one. Oh, I know that one, but oh, that's the, story. the days of unrestricted free enterprise will never come back. It won't if people haven't got, if, if we leave this government in, no. We have apparently just one way to go. You're if we get too far one way, we have no choice. You're not suggesting the NDP would free the forests and put them up for public bid? The NDP have more principles in my way of thinking and I'll balance this after 30 solid years, I would much prefer to have them as executor of my estate than the people that are in, if I could put it that way. Gordon Gibson, the author of The Bull of the Woods, hasn't changed a bit. And it's delightful to see. More with Gordon and some phone calls too after the break. I was just talking about evangelists a few minutes ago, and here I've got an evangelist here. Gordon, uh, it's no secret that you used to drink quite a lot. Yes, I did. I drank too much, Jack. When did you stop drinking? When the doctor told me, he said, if I kept out it another five years, I better go and see an undertaker. And I'm not, uh, you know, so I just said that's far enough. How long since, many years since you've had a drink? About 13. You would be, how much would you drink in a day in your bad old days? A good day would be two bottles, Jack. A, a, a poor day would be just one. But nothing to do with the, what you could afford. It was the time I had to drink it, you know what I mean. Some days you were busy. How old are you now? Seventy, well, two, four more days and I'm 76. How much did you pay for that wee piece of property at the far end and the then undesirable end of Murray? How many years ago? How many years ago did you buy the Mario Lou property? Well, Jack, 27 years ago. Is it correct that you paid less than $50,000 for that property? Jack, I'm going to tell you the quick story on it. The man that bought it just a week before I bought it, I, uh, he paid 17000 for it. And he had uh, three years to pay for it at 10% interest. So... Uh, I asked him if he could sell it, and he said, no, I'm not that kind of a shyster. I won't sell a thing until it's paid for. I said, uh, he said, come back in two years. I want a double. So I said, in other words, you want $34,000. He said, yes. I said, all right, I'll buy it if you'll let me walk over it. And I walked over it. He said there's no water there, and I knew there was because I saw some real green trees growing with everything else dead. So I bought it. Now... One nice thing I like about it is that I paid twice what he had paid two weeks before, and another nice thing is he took the piece of property, money I gave him, bought another piece of property, and sold it 
about seven, no, about eight years later for a half a million dollars. So he did well and I did well. And as a matter of fact, a lot of happy people there. Is it correct that $34,000 piece of property plus improvements yes. and a swimming pool in the shape of yes. British Columbia yes. created no by your own bulldozing? That's right. You sold it for $8 million. Uh, that's within a million. <laughs> when, I don't want to be exact. <laughs> well, I won't put you on I don't know. I wouldn't like the banker to hear that because no, he no, didn't no. get those. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, you right. got to look after these things in yeah. the proper way. Yeah. Tell me, in your political life, don't tell me the people you don't like. I could name them. Yes. Tell me the people you like. I like the kind of people that first establish that there's some use to themselves or to their boss and offer themselves with something to offer. And then I like the kind of people that like religion. Stay with it. I don't like a Catholic that would switch from a Catholic to a Protestant to get a few more oh, Convent? favorites, favors in heaven or something like that. I think myself, the ruination of British Columbia, and I say this with all sincerity, happened when they, when Winch should have been made uh, the Prime Minister, of, uh, the Premier of British Columbia, when we had the amalgamation of the Liberals and the... That's Where's what started. That's when Bennett left the Conservatives started this party th that were kind of half evangelistic, half printing their own money, half people who weren't quite sure what they were but wanted something else. That started the Social Credit Party. A lot of people went there and we've had, you're in my opinion, nothing since. You're going back to 1952 when a handful of votes in Barad decided that the new people across had perhaps one more seat than Harold Winch's party. That's right. And you think the governor, lieutenant governor at the time should have called Harold Winch Did the wrong thing. to a former government? Certainly. He sort of put Harold Winch in, and whether or not, whether he would have been a success or not, we would have known that much sooner. As it is, we've had nothing since except a government that right has been judged whether it would get more votes or not. Not whether it was right or not. Right according to social credit, is will it get you more votes? Possibly many other uh, political parties too. I'm not saying that. But the party in British Columbia mm -hmm. that has stayed true to the one type of doctrine is Dave Barrett's party. And I mean that. You know, in another day... And I'm still a liberal. Yeah, but in another clear. day you might well have finished up a socialist, Gordon Gibson. I may was still finish up a socialist. I'm, I'm just in the fourth quarter now. I might hang around here another 25 years. And unless we can get... You see, you've got three, Jack. I divide people up this way. Conservatives ought to be people. They've got everything they need, although still want more. That's the sad part about right. them. All they need but want more. Uh, yes. Now then you've got the uh, men like uh, the NDP that are trying very hard for to those read. that are entitled to a little bit more in many cases. The Alec McDonald's, the Dave Barrett. There, yes. And many, many of them. And, and then the, you've got the wishy-washy liberals in the yes, middle who don't uh, know what they are. That is true, but there's got to be, there's a strange thing about politics. Politics has to be, have somebody in Victoria over there to represent every type of people. You understand that, don't you? you if you just had the good there, that wouldn't be right. Mm -hmm. In members of parliament, you must have all types of people. But you do need people that wouldn't vacillate from one thing to the other. Remember when they used to call you the cut-and-get-out man? That is the most... That shows more ignorance than anything else in the world. It's like a man saying that somebody went and picked all the berries off a, a raspberry bush. Do you realize if you don't pick them, they go rotten? How much and of our timber in British Columbia is going rotten? There's, it may be about evening now, but had somebody come here a hundred years ago and taken one percent of our timber each year, completely done anything with it and removed it, not even planted one tree but let God plant them, we'd have double the timber we have now. So a cut-out and get-out operator was a man we needed. The first thing you have to do to farm timber that's of mature is cut it. 
and allow it to reseed. Yes. That's you don't it. think we're in danger of any forest famine in BC? No, we're in danger of people working hard enough to get it out. That's what I'm afraid we're in danger of. Webster and Gordon Gibson, and we'll take some phone calls after the break. Gordon Gibson is a man of extravagant statements. He means most of them. What do you think of this man Trudeau? Do you think he's in danger of splitting the country? Are you still really a true blue liberal? Jack, I always admire Brain. And uh, so on that mark, I have to give him full marks. But? I don't want the butts there too much until anybody can point out to me somebody that I'd approve is better. Now, the last one that came along was certainly something that I couldn't follow. And Joe then Clark? I, yeah, Joe Clark, I couldn't have followed him, and I don't think anybody else in Canada could. Now, he's, Pierre's not perfect. He's got all faults, but uh, world over, he's considered one of the best. If I compared him with the choices that in the surrounding countries, I think he's good. That's my opinion. I wish he wasn't Think he's going to split the country by accident? No, because this is the greatest country. No one would leave this country. You don't think separa separation is at it, all possible? It can't, because how can how, how can Peter Lougheed talk about separating anything? He'd be an island. He's going to have NDP on both sides of him. He needs a waterfront. And I'll tell you, he'd be better to go along with Pierre Trudeau than for him to throw his hat in, maybe with Barrett. Go, go ahead, please, to Gordon Gibson. Uh, Mr. Gibson? Yeah, speak up. Uh, Mr. Gibson, I'm a bit, uh, let me say, I, I think you've made a great contribution to British Columbia, but I'm a bit uh, confused about uh, your uh, expression of support for the NDP, and yet you remain a liberal. Obviously, you believe there's something in the Liberal Party uh, that would serve the province better than the NDP would or has. What is it that you see in your Liberal Party that causes you to remain in it? I'm not a socialist. That's the first thing. I was trying, I, when I talk about the uh, NDP, I want you to know that I am talking about the principles of the people and the principles that they've stayed consistently along one line. The people of British Columbia are the ones that destroyed we provincial liberals here. And we helped destroy ourselves, too, by some taking the easy road and joining the uh, social, social credit. credit. Uh, that should explain, I think, to you pretty well why I have my Thank feelings. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Gibson? Yep. Uh, I believe I don't believe in your social your uh, ideas about government. I think the conservatives have an excellent social policy and and they have a they believe greatly also in the yeah, uh, they have a question. System. What I'd like to ask him though is how he feels about the new conservative leader of uh, British Columbia, Brian Westwood. Have oh. you heard of the new conservative leader of British Columbia, Brian Westwood? Uh, I haven't heard of him, but I give him great great credit. It takes a lot of hard work, a lot of time, and that is. The best advice I can give to everybody that's a social creditor, go back to what they were, call themselves truly a conservative. That's what they were. A few, a few liberals got scattered in among them accidentally, but that's just a kind of a bastardly mix. It can't help it, you know. Go ahead, I mean, please. Hello? Yeah. That's you. Speak up. I'm still here. Uh, t speak up. You're on the air. Uh, in, re in regard to... Re no, he's got a problem. He won't turn down his television set. You know, tell, I'm seven seconds ahead of the television set, Gordon, and if they don't turn it down, they go squirrely, and so do I. I'm behind you. Go ahead, please. Yes, Gordon. Yeah. How did you acquire the Gold River Basin that you eventually sold off to the East Asiatic Company when you sold your sawmills? Well, my God, that's quite an effort. I'll tell you how I acquired that. Yeah, that was a I walked up that God darn thing when it was impossible up through a canyon. <laughs> never, never on Vancouver owned Island. on Vancouver Island, Gold River. Uh, went in and saw that beautiful timber in there. Recommended to some friends of mine that it would be a good buy. 
Our family sure as hell couldn't afford to buy it. They bought it. It never did belong to us in any way. It and took you three years to get the Crown Prince of Denmark to, uh, though, uh, to be accepted by W.C. Bennett, didn't it? I don't think it ever did. No, sir, I wouldn't say that. I found the Crown Prince of Denmark to be a very fine man to do business yes, with. but Bennett wouldn't accept him. I, I think it'd be the other way around. If I was using my judgment, uh, Axel mightn't have wanted to accept him. Oh, yeah, just to me. take your mind back, you're talking about the NDP. Do you remember, Gordon, it took us over six years to unionize your sawmill in Texas? That would, I know the only reason for that was that one of the head union men came in and said that if every camp was run as well as Gibson's camp, there'd be no need of a union at all in British Columbia. That's quite wrong. I'm talking about your sawmill and your logging camp and mushlet arm and uh, no way. I was one of those union members at the time. Were you? And you happen to be talking about Johnny Squire, who was up there, who is now one of the NDPs that you're praising. Johnny Squire was a very fine fellow. He sat in with me. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. We are, we were, is that Johnny talking to me? No, it's not. It was well, one I of didn't. his business. Well, I like this. Were you one of the union organizers at Mutchalat Arm? Yes, sir. And was Gordon difficult to you? Beg your pardon? Did Gordon not on a couple of occasions try and get you loaded and ride so you wouldn't do your union work? No, no. You didn't try and do that, Gordon, because we're a little smarter because there was no, the only liquor in town then was in your, uh, Guest house. Yeah, I, I did the drinking. The only drinking liquor and the... come in was on the boat on Friday night. The Uchuk, the Uchuk. Oh, no, your special liquor run from you, from Zabalas around to your camp. Yeah, that was run by a little concession, I guess. I, I know, uh, that was you control. Gordon, I had no part of it. Cannon, just a Gordon, moment, please, just a minute, just a minute. Just a moment, please, just a moment. Were you one time a bootlegger? Not to my knowledge. Jack, that's one business I would have failed in because there wouldn't have been anything left to sell. <laughs> that man is completely off base. Oh, well, you had a little brass cannon that we machined down in the machine shop and went into a bearing on the tugboat. Well, do you, do you remember the little brass cannon? Yeah. No, I can't think of uh, that. Your memory's slipping. What did you do with a cannon? <coughs> Big pardon? What did you do with a cannon? Oh, we machined it down to use it as a bearing on your tugboat. Well, we might have. I see you've been with me anyway. I'm very happy <laughs> here. <laughs> yes, you realize? I work for you, Gordon. Look, Good thanks, stuff. Thanks for your call. You've got friends everywhere. Good I, stuff. And a, a very beautiful lady sitting over there to whom I want you to wave now. Gertrude, <laughs> Mrs. Do. Gibson. Little wave. Wave again. <laughs> see? Most enjoyable garden. You bring back many memories to me, especially one day during the summer's case when we sat down in the Empress Motel, I think it was called, not the Empress Hotel, a motel. Yes. You drank a bottle of half a rye. You got up sober to speak, and when you sat down, you were drunk. I wouldn't believe that, Jack. I was there. Were you? Mind you, I didn't even smell the cock. No, I... Uh... <laughs> My thing... thanks to an old friend, Gordon Gibson, Intransigent liberal. Uh, where's the cover? It's the bull of the woods. The there he is, the bull of the woods. <laughs> and I'll be back after the break.